I think if, if we could just, and I'm totally realistic, by the way, I know this is challenging and probably impossible, but if we just in a, you know, alternate, alternate universe, just all of a sudden said, by the way, the way you get a grant and the way you get tenure is that you publish negative findings that help us figure out what doesn't work or what isn't true. And you either reproduce or fail to reproduce science. Like if we all of a sudden rewarded that with a nature publication and an R01, you might see less problem with reproducibility. Hey guys, Alex here, and welcome to another new episode of the DSI Podcast. I'm really excited to be joined by Patrick Malone today. He's a physician scientist turned investor at KDT Ventures, where he invests in early stage life science and healthcare, and founders building at the intersection of compute, biology, and chemistry. Prior to venture, he completed his MD and PhD degrees at Georgetown University, where his research focused on computational cognitive neuroscience and AI and machine learning applications in medicine. Today, we spoke about biotech versus tech bio, on writing, investing, fixing research, and the future of science. Hope you enjoy. So let's uh, let's start at the beginning, Patrick. You've you've taken this path, uh, you know, from studying neuroscience as an undergrad to getting your MD and your PhD, and now you find yourself working in venture capital. So let's let's start by walking through all of that because there's a lot to delve into there from the very beginning. So you know, we'll get into some of your work investing, but I'd be interested to hear first of all, like what drove those earlier interests and your path into academia earlier on. Yeah, no, 100. percent um... You know, my experience has been that the uncommon story is the common one. So a long and winding road as, as most everyone's is. So I, let's see, briefly at the beginning, born and raised in Akron, Ohio, uh, went to school in Atlanta from there, uh, studied computer science and neuroscience initially. So computers were kind of my initial, uh, I guess, non-academic interest that became my academic interest. Um, just kind of played around with computers when I was younger, taught myself to program, just got really into tinkering with computational stuff. Essentially, uh, once in college, started reading a couple books that were pretty formative. So one was, in case folks are interested in, in reading them, one is uh, a, company, a book called On Intelligence, um, actually written by the founder of Palm Pilot, if, if people are old enough to remember what Palm Pilot was. Um, Jeff Hawkins is his name, founded a Palm Pilot, and then eventually became a computational neuroscientist and wrote a book called On Intelligence about how we could think about modeling the human brain on a computer and kind of modeling the computational algorithm that runs between our ears, so to speak. Um, and, and the singularity is near was the second one, which is kind of a formative book for, for many folks in, in scientific and engineering disciplines. Anyway, long story short, studied neuroscience in undergrad because I was interested in this question of, of kind of modeling a human brain on a computer, um, got into a lab. Um, as many folks do in the lab, there's kind of this interesting formative moment that happens for scientists, it seems, where something in the lab just kind of all of a sudden takes them and, and really kind of drives home the point that they want to spend a, a career in science. Now, my friend uh, Elliot Hirschberg calls this nerd sniping, which I, I kind of like that term. But um, <laughs> for me, it was just being in a neurophysiology lab. If, if you spend any time in a neuroscience lab, you'll hear um, in electrophysiology experiments, the spikes of neurons, which are the action potentials of neurons. It's kind of the the language of the code, so to speak, of, of the central nervous system, hearing those spikes during experiments and then kind of taking those those data, that soft, uh, those data sets and writing computer software after code to essentially analyze those data and kind of understand something new about the brain was just really captivating for me and kind of formed the rest of how I spent my time post-college. So from there, I went to NIH, worked in kind of interdisciplinary uh, neuroengineering lab, working on movement disorders and biomarker development for neuro neurodegenerative disease. Uh, from there, did an MD-PhD, as, as you alluded to, um, did my PhD in computational neuroscience. Really, the goal throughout this whole process was to, to become a physician data scientist of sorts, um, to really kind of straddle this intersection between machine learning and medicine, which increasingly in 2012, when I was kind of getting into it, was revolutionizing all different types of medicine. Very few people kind of spoke both the language of computer science and also clinical medicine. So that was kind of the, the bridge I hoped to uh, to work around. Um, and then finally, as is often the case in life, serendipity intervenes, um, ended up in venture totally by chance. You know, I joke, but being quite serious that what I knew of venture was basically what I saw on the show, Silicon Valley, um, <laughs> serendipitously got connected with one of the founders at North Pond, where I, I was for a couple of years, another MD PhD sold me on venture, sold me on startups, um, got really enamored once I actually got involved with this idea, 
of being able to take really big visions, high risk ideas and build them into companies, you know, in science, it's often the case that scientific innovation is, is kind of incremental, not always, but oftentimes what gets funded, what gets published is, you know, something that just layers upon the kind of status quo. And, and for good reason, this is how science usually advances. Um, and it's certainly been successful. Uh, but for me, you know, getting into venture, seeing these entrepreneurs, especially technical scientific entrepreneurs that would leave academia to work on the big thing that certainly the NIH would be too funded, too uh, risky for the NIH to be funded, just really kind of spoke to me, the ability to, to partner with these folks and help them build towards those big visions. So anyway, fast forward to now, I've joined uh, KDT Ventures, another early stage kind of frontier science firm, investing at the intersection of compute, bio and chemistry, pre-seed and seed stage, looking for kind of the next generation of scientists and engineers that are kind of building towards these big visions. So anyway, that's kind of the winding winding path to, to where I am now. I love it, man. So off the back of that, you, you've alluded to, I guess, a little bit of the reasoning here, but you know, you went on to work at North Pond and now, now KDT, of course, the, the technical expertise was always there, right? But I'd be curious to dig into why investing in particular, like why was investing of interest of you um, um, coming out of that MD, PhD environment rather than going that data science or, or academic route? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. It's, it's actually what I was planning on doing, going the data science route, either within academia, yep. medicine or industry. Um, for me, it was I, I enjoyed going deep during the PhD. I mean, that's what a PhD is, is you're acquiring domain expertise in some area. Um, I really like that. I, I wasn't really searching for something more, but it turns out once I got into venture, I, I found something that I liked more, and that is breadth over depth. I think there's a lot of a lot of value in kind of taking this like T-shaped approach where there's something that you're very deep on. You know, for me, it was kind of neuroscience and machine learning and medicine, but then you have this T of the, the top bar of the T where you're actually quite broad and you cover a bunch of different areas and kind of expand out. Venture gives you that. Um, you know, in academia, you can spend 20 years studying one protein's role in a disease, for example. Um, it became clear that that was never really going to be me. I, I kind of have, um, you know, intellectual ADD to some degree where I have lots of different interests and like to read very broadly. Venture really kind of spoke to me in that way it was the ability to focus on what I know, which was the areas that I trained in, but also learn a bunch of different stuff that I had no idea about, but came up the curve very quickly. That was one piece that was kind of my wedge into venture. But then once I actually got in and, and kind of realized the day to day, as I alluded to before, the ability to meet some of the smartest scientists, engineers, founders building towards the future, like it really is a front row seat to the future that I'm not smart enough to build. I just got to be smart enough or not dumb enough is probably the better term that when somebody, you know, is sitting across the table from me or sitting across the Zoom from me that's building this future that I'm you know, smart enough to see what they're trying to do and, and kind of get aboard and try and help in the small ways that I can. And, and that ultimately is what got me to stay in venture, the ability to be quite broad in my interests, invest in you know machine learning for healthcare, whether it's some type of clinical decision support tool, some computational drug discovery company using machine learning for drug development, or some synthetic biology company building the next generation of, of kind of synthetic meat, for example. Um, so really just technical entrepreneurs building the future, trying to impact the world positively to have a, you know, a very small part to play in that and have a front row seat to it is, is really what kind of made this just the, the career for me. Definitely. All right, cool. So let's, let's get into some of the fun stuff here. Um, first things first, you're a big proponent of this sort of emerging field, if you want to call it, uh, called tech bio, which as I understand, uh, it really appears at the intersection of biology, machine learning, automation, and, and other fun stuff. But to set the stage here for a moment, what is tech bio um, and how does it compare to our you know, traditional understanding of biotech, um, maybe as an elevator pitch here? Yeah, sure. It's, it's, it's funny. I realize that perhaps my online presence indicates that I'm a, a champion of tech bio, which I am. But it's funny just coming into this, I was, uh, was and am skeptical uh, or I guess have a healthy degree of skepticism. So in tech bio, just to define terms, I, I, to me, especially since you're comparing it to biotech, Let's just focus on kind of AI driven drug discovery, which I think most people when they say tech bio, even though I have a more broad conception of what tech bio is, let's just focus on AI driven drug discovery. Um, for me, there's lots of different features of tech bio, but really, you know, I think a lot of this, there's kind of fair pushback to this is a little bit more marketing than anything. I'll come back to what I think is the real uh, kind of underlying feature of tech bio that matters. but. 
I see this more or less as a spectrum. I mean, there's biotech, there's tech bio, there's a gradation of involvement of computational technologies. Again, mostly machine learning, but this can be quantum computing, biophysical simulation, any type of technology beyond just kind of the traditional biological techniques on which biotech was traditionally built. Um, there's lots of different differences that I think are fair things to point out. Being founder-led is one, for example. So rather than having some you know repeat entrepreneur coming in to build the company, you have the scientist that spins out with the company, building the company from day zero through IPO, for example. Um, tight integration between wet lab and dry lab. So rather than just generating biological data, you're actually generating biological data, using software infrastructure to organize it in such a way that you can apply machine learning, iterate to improve biological workflows and kind of these fast iteration cycles of design, build, test, learn, et cetera. Um, you know, the list goes on. I think the biggest one that's underemphasized, I don't want to rehash a lot of great writing that's, that's already out there on this topic. It really comes down to the people in my mind. Um, and it's really twofold. One is the founders and the teams they build. So traditionally in biotech, and again, these are large generalizations. There's, there's certainly nuance here. Traditionally, biotech looked like a lot of biochemists, microbiologists, you know, some type of like strong biological discipline founding a company. And then eventually once they found repeat companies, there's more and more, you know, say 40, 50, 60 year old folks founding companies. And that certainly has been very successful. I think the biggest difference in AI driven drug discovery sometimes is a much more technical person founding the company, whether it's a computer scientist or an electrical engineer, or biomedical engineer, or physicist, somebody that doesn't come from the biological world, moving into the biological world and adopting a lot of kind of the first principles thinking and mental model and frameworks that are more typical of engineering disciplines than biological disciplines. Because one only needs to spend a couple of years on an academic campus to, to realize that most of these departments have different mental models, different biases, different frameworks, and all of that gets incorporated into how you build a company. And so for me, it's like a difference in philosophy at day zero based on the phenotype of founder and the teams that they built. So oftentimes, and again, this is true of biotech too, oftentimes tech bio companies end up having very interdisciplinary teams, interdisciplinary both in the different individuals they bring to the company, whether it's a huge neuroscientist or a computer scientist, rather, a few biologists, et cetera, but interdisciplinary and, you know, in one's own mind and the training they get, it could be a undergrad in computer science, they got a microbio PhD, et cetera. So that's one piece is the people, which is, I guess, very important. And the people also on the investing side too. I mean, there's a, a bunch of very storied, very successful, thoughtful biotech investors. There's another generation of both tech funds, tech VCs that have pivoted into biotech, but also de novo funds founded over the last couple of years that, you know, coined themselves tech bio investors or, or biotech investors, but just have more of kind of a computational bent. So I think for all these reasons, like at the end of the day, all of this is a people business. There's different phenotypes of people building these companies and investing in these companies. And I think that drives ultimately a lot of the, the differences here. But again, it's a spectrum between biotech and tech bio. I don't see it as overly dogmatic or, or um, binary in my mind. Definitely makes sense. I, I, I wonder, like taking a longer term view here for a moment, this is something you mentioned, I think briefly, but it seems like there's some credible arguments that um, I guess tech bio as a space um, has sort of yet to deliver um, at, at the level many people hoped it would. So that in mind, what do you think matters the most in separating substance from hype here and like actually realizing um, the potential that this space might have to offer? 100%. Yeah. So I, I think, and this is where I'll become more, I'll sound like more of a, a skeptic. And I do this just because um, actually Shelby at Compound, just the day that we we're recording this, just published a piece uh, really thoughtfully di dissecting some of these these issues. I think we're at as she phrases it in like a certain point of the hype cycle where 100% machine learning is going to and is in some ways moving the needle on drug discovery. That said at the moment, so I'm long-term very bullish on the use of many of these technologies and drug discovery. That said, the space is overhyped in my opinion broadly for a few reasons. I think the three broad claims for many of these companies for why machine learning is effective in drug discovery is really threefold. One, accelerates timelines, so get the drugs to clinic more quickly. Two, drives down costs of drug development. And three, increases probability of success. I think amongst those three things, only the third one matters. Ultimately, what matters is that we're using approaches, machine learning or otherwise, that are developing more effective drugs and treating patients more effectively. The first two, getting to clinic faster, you know, it kind of matters because if you develop these 
net present value models of a particular drug, like all that can be the value of the asset can be increased by the fact that it gets to clinic more quickly because it means revenue more quickly. But ultimately, I don't think that really matters. And, and there's also, I think, a credible argument in both directions of why machine learning would both lengthen the timeline to clinic, but also hasten it. Um, you know, I did, I just did some kind of rudimentary and, and um, yeah, rudimentary data-driven analyses here to kind of test this claim. I just went on clinicaltrials.gov and just wrote some code to just pull all of the current clinical phase assets in drug development and then pull out the quote unquote AI discovered assets. So these are drugs that are basically developed by companies like Exientia, Recursion, like the typical prototypical AI driven drug discovery companies. I'm actually curious just to, to pull, pull you on this. If you had to guess how many AI driven drug discovery assets there are out there at the moment. And again, we can obviously debate on what a AI driven drug discovery company is, but if it's like the benevolent, the recursions in silico, like the ones that no one would debate are AI driven, how many would you say there are? Are there, is there one, 10, a hundred? What's your, what's your intuition? I have no idea to be Throw honest with you. Up. I would intuitively like probably more centralized than people expect it to be. Just give me a number. I'm curious. 10. So that's a good guess. That's, so I've heard everything across the board. It's, it's uh, 14 by my count, although I think um, Nathan oh, of, it's not bad. of okay. AI, I think it's closer to 20 actually. But people, mm. some people have totally different intuitions here. They think it's one, they think it's 100. Point is it's early, um, but you can actually, I got a bit off track, but you can actually look at what is the time of founding the company to when they actually have a first drug in clinic. If AI-driven drug discovery companies get to clinic faster, you'd expect that it would take them two years from founding to clinic versus five years, what is average. I actually found the opposite. So it was actually a year longer for AI-driven drug discovery companies to get to clinic. Now, I don't conclude anything from this analysis. It's confounded in every which direction um, for many different reasons. And you could actually make the opposite argument that like upfront costs of investment and development of the platform for these AI-driven drug discovery companies prolong them getting a clinic. Many biotech companies spin up for just one asset where they're just all focused on that. So anyway, point is like the data certainly isn't solid that you get to clinic faster. Um, second one, more capital efficient. I think these things are actually probably more capital inefficient. They require more upfront investment, but probability excess is all that matters. Um, and to my point earlier about there only being 2019 ish clinical stage assets, meaning those in clinical development, we have no FDA approved AI discovered drugs. Like we need to have, dozens of drugs that have both failed and been approved to actually be able to quantify what is the improvement of a probability of success. So it's still very early days. It's difficult to understand exactly where and when and how AI is moving the needle on drug discovery. There are examples of this for sure, specific startups that are very thoughtful about this. This is just the point that I've been convincing myself of as being a you know, quote unquote biotech outsider, someone that doesn't have a background in drug development, now investing in this space, learning about where the space is currently, where machine learning has moved the needle, where it's not, and trying to separate kind of substance from hype, if that makes sense. Totally, totally. So, you know, having spoken a little bit about what makes this space unique, where else do you think the same principles can be applied? Um, you know, you've spoken, I think, some about the promise of chemistry here and that it's more computationally tractable um, than biology, which is to say it's like easier to define in modeling. Um, how do you tend to think about this, like within or outside of that particular example? Yeah, I mean, here, the chemistry example is really interesting because, um, again, I, I, I probably hedge too much, but you could probably make the argument either way. I think on the one hand, chemistry should be a more computationally tractable problem than biology for a couple of reasons. One, there's actually well understood, like this is why we can like model E equals MC squared and F equals MA and like all these physical equations because we understand the underlying physics and mathematical descriptions of these phenomena. Thermodynamics, we obviously, for example, very important in chemistry and chemical reactions, we have mathematical descriptions and equations of these processes and therefore they should be more model modelable. But the one thing machine learning has taught us is actually there's been a long time where we've like protein folding, for example, there's been these physics driven approaches where you actually try to model the energetics of these proteins and then use physics to figure out what the energy minimization state is for a particular conformation of a protein. But really AlphaFold throws all that out the window. They're like, we don't give a shit about what the physics are. All we gotta do is throw enough data at the machine learning algorithm. It's gonna figure out all of the abstractions above all of those energetics and just figure out the right structure. Um, so I, you know, I, on the one hand, I think having 
all of chemistry or a lot of chemistry rooted in actual mathematical descriptions should make it more amenable to quote unquote tech bio. But on the other hand, some of this is just like an empirically driven process like AlphaFold and maybe it doesn't matter. The second is that there's just, it, it, my sense is it's a bit more straightforward in some cases to generate data sets that are amenable to machine learning using like well understood assays with some reasonable throughput um, to put the data in such a way that it's amenable to machine learning is, is the other point. The last point I'll make is that I think a lot of um, uh, a lot of this is there's like a bit of a mismatch like recursion, which I, I think is a fantastic example of, of, of drug dis computational drug discovery and a thoughtful use of a, a technology, in this case, convolutional neural networks, for example, when they first got started for phenotypic screening, like really strongly typifies like algorithm application fit. When they published their S1, like one thing that struck me is that they're building this massive phenotypic map, which is basically, uh, maybe I'm assuming um, too many things here, but they're, they built this massive phenotypic map of kind of biological relationships in various cell cellular disease models. And there was something like 200 billion on the order of that biological relationships in this phenotypic map, each of which or many of which could actually be druggable. And then at that point, the chemical compound screening library they were using to actually perturb that biology and, and build a therapeutic was less, something like 6,000. Now that's grown a lot, but you can see the mismatch between like biology, disease biology that's available to perturb and, and ultimately improve disease and the chemistry available to actually perturb and modulate that biology. And so I think a lot of this is like, I'm, I, it's, we should focus on both. There's a lot of companies trying to characterize biology without as much focus on what is the actual chemistry available to intervene in that biology. Um, part of where I think tech chemist or tech chemistry, if you want to call it that is already making huge headways there. We have a company in our portfolio of Teray Therapeutics working on this problem as well, to some degree. Um, exciting space for sure. Super cool. So to, to go off of that and sort of take more of an investing angle here, there's some really interesting investment dynamics that apply not just in tech bio, but in, in, in biotech as a whole here. Um, and, and at the core of this, as you've written about, I think is the difference in power laws that kind of govern the space. And I, I think the data you shared says something like um, that a, a sample in traditional venture shows five or 6% of investments accounting for, I think, 60% of returns. Um, whereas in biotech, 13% of investments account for 43% of returns with um, a pretty significantly larger share of profit driven by, um, you know, one or five X investments versus 10 X or more um, investments. Why do you think this is the case? Like, why is the power law less pronounced here? Yeah, it's a, a question I'm still trying to answer. I, I would love, I, there's, many more data-driven analyses that I think can be done here if we had the right data set to understand, but a couple of thoughts. I think one, the reality is there just isn't, so just to back up a little bit for perhaps non-investors that might be interested in this, there's, it's very much a home run business, venture capital is. You invest in companies that you hope to become 100x, 1,000x your investment. Um, you're not playing for just doubles and triples, like just doubling your money on single company investments. Um, and so therefore you're investing in, to my point earlier, founders that are building really impactful platforms and companies that are going to be huge returns. Um, in technology, so investing in the, the Facebooks and Googles and Apples of the world, the ceiling there is trillion dollar companies, right? The market caps of these companies are one, two plus trillion dollars. That just doesn't exist in biotech and healthcare. Um, you know, the biggest outcomes, Moderna is, is the biggest biotech investment, I think, but most biotech companies, you know, are, are going to exit anywhere from a few hundred million to a billion to a couple billion in the really successful cases. But these companies, and same with healthcare, you know, Livongo in digital health is probably the biggest outcome being acquired for 18 billion, now trading for less than that, but that's a multi-billion dollar outcome. But there's not like hundred billion, a bunch of hundred billion dollar, trillion dollar outcomes here. Um, and so I think the ceiling is a bit lower for biotech and healthcare compared to technology. But I also think by, and this is the thing I, I, I can't actually prove or I don't have data to support, but perhaps just some conceptual arguments. The floor, I think is a bit higher too. Um, not that these companies can't fail, um, but I do think even for companies that don't become the huge, huge winners, they're still impacting patients. They're still making impact in the healthcare world. But there's also some strategic value oftentimes to these platforms that somebody else seeks to acquire, like a software platform that's built some infrastructure for, you know, pharma, for example, or some, 
value-based care platform that's gone after you know one disease that a bigger value-based care platform wants to acquire to because of strategic alignment between the patient populations their physician populations like there's a bunch of different reasons but i suspect the floor is a bit higher so these companies may not succeed as much being you know, 100 billion dollar outcomes but they certainly don't go to zero as much as you know the latest fashionable social media platform for example um and so i think perhaps the the you know, the power law is just a little bit more, the distribution outcomes is a little more normally distributed versus power law distributed as it is in, is in tech. Um, but I haven't, I would love to have access to a data set uh, that would allow me to actually test some of these claims, you know, with actual quantitative stuff. Definitely. All right, so to, to shift gears here for a minute, I guess to look at this um, a little bit more broadly, a lot of the topics that I'm referencing throughout this come straight from you, right? So you, you do a lot of writing, you've launched a newsletter called, uh, I think it's just called Tech Bio, uh, with some friends and colleagues investing in the space. Um, fundamentally, I'd, I'd be curious, beyond just the standpoint of communication, what would you say drives you to write? Like, why do any of this in the first place? Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing, and I, I've talked about this before, so I'll, I'll, I might repeat myself, but um, first and foremost, it just helps me think. Like my, my experience, is, as many other folks may be, is Oftentimes when I sit down to write something, 50% uh, of what I thought to be true was actually just logically incorrect once I actually start writing. Like it's an extension of one's mind in that way and allows you to kind of poke holes in your own thinking. So that's one phenomenon. The second is that 50% of what I ultimately come to believe, I never even realized or figured out until I sat down to write. So writing is like a bunch of people have written on this. Paul Graham, for example, founder of Y Combinator, has a bunch of really fantastic essays where he really describes writing as a generative process, uh, not a process where you already have the ideas and you get them down on paper. Like you don't write to think, you write to to figure out what you think. So that's first and foremost, the reason why I do it. It's just, it's just the way I learn. Um, I chose recently, somewhat recently, to just start doing it in a more public way because I realized it's actually a great way to like, like most of the shit I say is wrong. <laughs> it's just the, like I have the humility to realize that. And so what better way yeah. to like, like my sense is like, I love being wrong. I don't want to be wrong a moment longer than I need to be. And the best way to do that is to put your ideas out into the world and, and get feedback on how they're right, how they're wrong and, and get into like really interesting debates with other people that are smarter than you. Um, so that's the, the biggest reason for me. The second biggest reason to do it is like, there's a lot of stuff out there. I don't know. I'm learning every day. It's why I love what I do. Um, and so there's just no better way to, to learn from people that are actually expert in this space or know more about it for me is put ideas or thoughts or questions out there and get feedback on them and then kind of iterate from there. Sweet. So, you know, with that practice of writing as kind of a backdrop here, talking about that move from academia into venture again, uh, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing um, a bit about the relationship you found between operating in both worlds, right? Like, is, is there a practice or a skill, maybe it's writing, um, that you found to be surprisingly similar, similar or, or transferable necessarily in working across the two? Yeah, that's a good question. I think there's probably far better people to answer this than me because I, I was, there's a lot of folks now in undergrad even, but especially graduate school or medical school, they're now getting involved in startups, entrepreneurship, and investing during graduate school, which I think is really interesting. And it probably adds a really unique lens to how you how you actually construct uh, and participate in your training. For me, you know, I, I as I said before, I, I got through, you know, seven of my eight years of my MD, PhD program before even knowing what venture was. So I, I didn't really have that. But that said, I still acquired, I think, some skills, just epiphenomaly that were uh, very applicable to venture. The biggest one, and I, you know, I don't mean to overgeneralize, I think this is most specific for if you want to do biotech or science-driven investing, the ability to read a paper, evaluate a claim, evaluate a hypothesis, evaluate data to understand like what are the claims here that are actually supported based on the data? What are the unmet needs? What's the next experiment that I would design? So I'd say anyone that's interested in building a company in biotech or healthcare or evaluating these companies from the investing side, the best skill to develop is kind of the same one that you develop during your graduate days. And that is reading papers, technically evaluating data and claims, understanding what the polls are and what you would design next. Cause this is a lot of what you do when you build a company or what you do when you evaluate a company is like, okay, where's the technical risk today? And then where, what are the additional technical milestones or experiments that I want to see to build this company to get its next stage of financing or for me to underwrite some risk for a company. So I think 
a lot of ways of doing that. Participating in journal clubs is a really fantastic one. Talking to people that are more you know, postdocs, PIs, more senior than you that have, have a lot of wisdom to impart. Writing is another great one. Like every area of science has its own kind of niche of, of Twitter that is just fantastic. Um, like neuroscience Twitter from my world is awesome. Machine learning is fantastic. Um, attending conferences, like really a lot of the stuff that folks are doing already, I think is, is how you really learn to develop this muscle that you can translate to startups. Totally. I think as a natural segue here from a lot of the topics in academia, I, I wanted to get um, your take or, or take some time to talk a bit about your take on research as a whole. Um, in your opinion, what would you say is the biggest problem facing scientific research and funding models today? So, you know, maybe if, if Patrick was was king, um, how would how would you change it all if you had the chance? Oh, man. Um, if it's I a big question. One, yeah, <laughs> it's 100%. Um, the biggest one is probably incentive structure in academic science. Um, and there's, there's many layers to this. I mean, the first is the currency of academic science is publications, um, at the end of the day and publications, not for negative findings, for positive findings and not just for positive findings, but for, you know, super sexy, splashy findings that drives a lot of the problems that we see. Um, you have a reproducibility crisis because, you're not going to get published in Cell Nature or Science showing that you disproved or didn't support the paper that got published in those journals the year before, right? There's a very perverse incentive for that not really to be that interesting, although this is changing. There are some really interesting trends I can highlight that are uh, kind of counter to this. Um, but I think the focus on the publication bias for positive findings, file drawer effect, as it's known, where negative findings just get stored away and no one ever finds out about them. Um, the currency of venture, as I mentioned, being sorry, the currency of academic science being publications. This is how you get grants. This is how you get faculty positions. This is how you get tenure. Um, I think if if we could just, and I'm totally realistic, by the way, I know this is challenging, and probably impossible, but if we just in a you know alternate alternate universe, just all of a sudden said, by the way, the way you get a grant and the way you get tenure is that you publish negative findings that help us figure out what doesn't work or what isn't true and you either reproduce or fail to reproduce science. Like if we all of a sudden rewarded that with a nature publication and an R01, you might see less problem with reproducibility. Um, I think that's the biggest one is just incentives around how we publish, what we publish, how you get grants. Um, there are some interesting trends here, which I can highlight. Some of them relate to open science as well, but I think incentive structures is probably the, the source of a lot of issues we see in academic science today. Totally. In that same sort of context of incentives around what is published in the first place, one really surprising stat I've heard you mention is that, um, if I'm recalling correctly, is that the majority of scientists would change their research focus if they didn't have to apply for grants. Um, what's the driving factor for this misalignment um, in interest in research, do you think? Yeah, well, that was uh, something I, I just wrote on a tweet that, that ended up being a spicier take than I realized. It got a lot of... Um engagement pushback. I was just, it was fascinating to see the, the polarized responses to that. Um, I think that's driven by the fact that what I think is the most interesting or impactful thing for me to spend my scientific life studying is not necessarily the same. And in fact, often not the same as the thing that I think is going to secure an R01. So R01 being the big NIH grant that everyone, uh, everyone tries to get multi-million dollar five-year grant often. Um, sometimes it is, but oftentimes it isn't. And so I, as a scientist may have some pet project that I think is like really important to figuring out the next plausible mechanism for Alzheimer's disease, for example. But I know, and, and by the way, I think this happened probably to many scientists throughout the story of the amyloid hypothesis in Alzheimer's. There's probably lots of really intelligent scientists out there that had some interesting insight for where they thought would be a fruitful research path to developing some new therapeutic for Alzheimer's, but they knew that places like the NIH were really looking for the latest and greatest in the amyloid hypothesis. And by the way, the study section of NIH probably included many folks that you know, had a horse in this race that perhaps built their careers on the amyloid hypothesis. And so I think, I don't mean to paint with too broad a brush. I, I think there's probably many explanations for this, but I think some percentage of scientists out there realize that the thing they think, I think they really want to work on, or they think they think is most impactful is not necessarily the thing that's going to get them the next grant pay the bills and help them get tenure and, and kind of the job security they seek. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, as you, as you mentioned, pushing for making research open source is something you seem to be a pretty big proponent for. 
um, which I guess brings us into the realm of DSI a little bit more. So before we hear about the how, you know, I'd love to touch on the why, um, specifically within DSI or, or open science in general, um, I'd love to hear your take on what strikes you as um, sort of the best the best solutions and what makes the most sense um, in, in making research open source. Yeah, another good question. This can go in a lot of different directions. I think um, open source can mean many different things. I'll just pick a couple. I think open sourcing data is really interesting, although I'll flag some potential issues. Um, you know, one, I think it's really expensive to generate data, and there's a lot of redundant projects out there generating very similar data types. And so one way to help address the reproducibility, excuse me, um, the reproducibility issue is to put data out there in the world that people can actually, other labs uh, can actually play with, reproduce, expand, you know, it's just a more efficient, more, if you think about it in terms of ROI for the investment dollars, taxpayer dollars, that actually go into funding these projects. It's a way to make sure we derive every last insight and have every bit of confidence in each of those insights uh, per dollar spent by the taxpayer. There are some issues. I mean, many times what we do in academia is we'll collect some really difficult data set to collect. And if there's some, and we publish on it, and there may not just be one paper we want to publish, we, want, we might want to publish many papers. Um, and it's so there are some new issues here where, you know, perhaps you don't want to open source that data set and allow many other players to come in and analyze those data who didn't go through the, the work and the trouble and the investment in collecting those data. And so it's not a panacea. I don't mean to say that like we should all data should be open source always, but I do think it's a really, there's a really strong claim for the purpose of reproducibility and, and ultimately impacting patients, which always should be the North star and, and translational work to getting these data out there to allow as many people to work on them as possible. Um, publications, same thing. I think one, one really interesting journal, eLife, there are other journals doing this, but eLife is kind of a first mover here. They do things like they, they publish everything open access, which I think is important. Um, they also, and I love they do this, they, they publish the reviews of the paper, um, uh, not anonymous, anonymously. So if you review a paper, oftentimes it, historically in other journals, you could hide behind an anonymous name and, and you could torpedo the paper because say it went against your you know pet theory, like I alluded to before. You can't do that with eLife. You got to put your name on there and, and publish it along with the paper. And I just think that's a really great way of aligning incentives, making sure you know the maximal intellectual value is realized with that paper because you get to learn even more from the reviews. I actually find them just as valuable to read as from the paper. Anyway, I think data and, and publications are two really interesting developments in kind of the open science movement. So having spoken about, you know, a lot of these really interesting developments, I'd, I'd love to hear your take on like how a lot of these come to fruition, right? Like from the standpoint of how you might enable some of, you know, these themes and objectives you spoke about, like, what do you think is the mechanism, um, especially in, you know, a space as entrenched as academia, um, what's the mechanism by some of, by which some of these changes happen in your opinion? Yeah, let's see. Um, I mean, one big one that I think is already happening, it's got a you know, mandated by the funding agencies. Like I'm not exactly, it's, it's been a little bit since I've paid attention to the bleeding edge of this space, but I, I think there are some, I don't want to misspeak, but I, there are some funding agencies out there that now mandate that you publish the data, for example, in some reasonable time frame. or I think one of the European journals or organizations said that like, everything's got to be published in an open access journal. So that's one way of doing it is like, you just say, you know what, well, you're gonna take our money, you got to do these things. That's one way that should happen. Um, ultimately, again, to go back to my question of incentives, and this isn't a thing that I claim to have an answer for, I think it's a hard problem. How do you incentivize scientists to do this? I, I think there's like a great cultural movement over the last 10, 15 years, where more and more scientists, just by virtue of the culture that the scientific community establishes, are incentivized to do things like publish negative results or at least talk about negative results. Um, one of the really, and this was not true when I got into science, but it's increasingly true. You see papers or sorry, journals publishing corrections that actually uh, are issued or initiated by the actual author of the paper. So it's not just like the Alzheimer controversy where we've seen where some you know, vigilante scientist discovers some error in the image and, and publishes that this thing is actually fraudulent. Um, these are scientists that actually go back and realize like, oh shit, I, you know, one little bug in my code actually meant that this entire line of reasoning and that I publish is not correct. And I'm going to go to the journal and retract that paper like that. Just as a human, that is like an incredible thing that they've done that. Like that's, you know, huge reputational risk to say like, hey, I, I fucked up. Like this is not right. 
I got to retract this paper. But you're increasingly seeing that happen because I think we've gone from like not from judging people to not judging people to now there's like a lot of honor and, and courage to do that, which we all realize and, and we actually applaud people for it. So a lot of this, again, comes down to the culture and kind of incentive structures that we create that I think are continuing to move in, in the right direction. Definitely. To take a few steps back and like broaden our scope as we start to close things out here, there's a really interesting question that also I think begs our attention when we talk about the future of science, and it's something um, you shared. It's it's from Ted Chiang's The Future of Science, which is a really cool read. Um, but the question is is basically what happens when scientific discoveries advance to the point that they're no longer understandable by humans, right? Like when we sort of progress down this uh, like to to such a degree of granularity, which I think comes about naturally. Um, what does that look like? Oh man, we could talk for hours on this. This is such an interesting, uh, such an interesting thing to think about. It's it's tricky in so many different directions. I think there's this expectation that, and we have to make sure we define like what science is. Science is in the business of generating. Since we're the practitioners of science, they must be human comprehensible explanations for natural phenomena. And so there's a bit of this trickiness in terms of semantics, where like if some type of knowledge is being generated by an algorithm, for example, that's not human comprehensible. Is it really science? Like it's not really an explanation. It's just some prediction with no underlying explanation or why attached. But I think we're increasingly coming in this direction. And, and the issue to me is to what degree will our need as human scientists to understand the why start to prevent scientific progress in some directions? Like just to give you an example, um, in drug discovery, like the way we've had huge success up to date is this like target centric approach in drug discovery. We have some protein, for example, that we want to target, some hypothesis for how that target or protein is involved in a disease, and then some hypothesis of a mechanism of action for a therapeutic where if we block that target, we're going to have some therapeutic benefit for the patient or organism. Like that is a very reductionist way of looking at things. And, and by the way, it's been hugely successful. There's many diseases that have been cured or were treated using this approach. But there's nothing in the laws of physics or biology that says that like every disease should be that way. And just as we just as we wouldn't expect, you know, your your dog or cat at home to understand calculus, we shouldn't necessarily expect that every disease out there should be comprehensible by humans. And so one wonders, especially with the, man, the progress in language models have been wild lately. Um, you know, wonder if, if at some point we have predictions for a drug uh, that will show like, hey, this drug will work. Um, this drug will um, this drug will treat this disease. We'll be able to test it and show that it works. Um, but we'll have no idea the mechanism of action in a way that we can explain ourselves in, in human understandable terms. And we'll have no idea what the actual underlying biology is. Um, and so it's more of a question than anything. I think it's a really interesting thing to talk about, especially with the pace of which machine learning is advancing. Um, you know, what is the role as these large language models increasingly play a role in our lives, both with writing, which I think is more near term, a thing I'm like thinking a lot about slash worried about, um, which is a whole other digression, like how we actually separate signal from noise in an era where so much of these text things that we're reading are generated by AIs or humans augmented by AI, but also in the scientific world, like how we should think about an AI scientist that augments what we do, potentially eventually replaces some of what we do, where prediction matters, we don't care about the why, where the why actually matters, and we should be thoughtful about how we actually use the AI. A million questions. It's a super interesting and a very important, important topic. Awesome. Last one for you, and this is a bit broad, um, but it's one I really enjoy asking. So I guess to, to keep our, ourselves on topic, uh, but anything within the scope of some of the stuff we've talked about, biotech, tech bio, DSI, open science, any of this stuff, what do you think more people should be paying attention to? <laughs> oh, man, it's a good question. Um, you know, I, it's not something I, don't, I think more, I think a lot of people are paying attention to it. Um, Maybe not enough, but there's certainly a lot of people are. So it's not really an answer to your question, but it's a thing I've been thinking a lot about is this this question of the role of these generative algorithms in everything. I mean, in the space I carry, but care about, which is healthcare and biotech, but just in content creation broadly, I think it's something we really need to think about. I mean, it's you know, this is not my idea. I, I read it somewhere, but there's always been this expectation that an AI – 
we would replace motor tasks first. Like we'd have some robot that could fold our clothes or drive us to the grocery store. And, and then we would have cognitive tasks that help us with, you know, our math homework or whatever else. And then finally you have creative tasks like, you know, generating images and paintings, et cetera. It's going the absolute opposite direction, right? Like turns out motor control is really fucking hard and we still can't like you know, those Boston Dynamics robots you see like still fail spectacularly. Cognitive tasks are, are certainly, we're making headway, but the creative tasks are, are disrupting first, which is the opposite of what we'd expect. And so the question is like, what do we do when we have these algorithms? Like when you, when you, we're already all flooding in a deluge of information and all have information overwhelmed. Like how do we separate what is high priority and important from what's not when the content streams are already so overwhelming and now all of a sudden we have AIs that can push this out at any throughput as necessary. How do we separate, you know, signal from noise there? Um, you know, what are you about homework? Like we, when kids, how do you keep people from plagiarizing if they're just generating their, their homework pieces? Um, you know, I was at NeurIPS this week and, and I talked to a, a couple machine learning researchers that are working on some of these large language models. And, and they expect that a lot of, if not most of mathematical proofs by 2030 are going to be generated by AI. I mean, it's like, I've always been a skeptic of the degree to which automation will replace many jobs. But I think this is the most worried I've been of like, man, what effect does this have on a lot of what we do? People are talking about this. I, it's not really an answer to your question of like, what are not enough people worried about? But this is certainly top of my list of things I'm thinking a lot about. And you know, how do we imagine the world and, and our role in it with these uh, really incredible advances in, in AI over the last couple of years? Yeah, important nonetheless, right? Cool. Patrick, close this out here, man. Uh, where can people find you? Where can people find uh, about more about KDT? Um, close this out. Yeah, we do. Um, so I'm, I'm active on Twitter, as we've discussed. I, I write on a, a sub stack for kind of the world as we see it in the area of, of biotech and, and technology. Um, KDT, check out our, our website. We have a fantastic portfolio of companies that we obviously feel incredibly strongly about. Um, we're looking at new opportunities all the time. So if you're working on something, feel free to reach out. Um, we have a podcast I have not contributed to yet, but some of my uh, colleagues and friends at KDT do called The World in a Grain of Sand, which dissects S1s for biotech and healthcare companies. It's just an awesome, super thoughtful podcast. Um, yeah, some of the areas that, uh, that we're active in. Amazing. Patrick, thank you so much, man. This has been amazing. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in. If you'd like any information about this podcast and about Molecule, or if you're interested in going deeper into today's topics, feel free to visit Molecule's site, Twitter, or Discord. You can find all the important links in the description and show notes below. Also, if you're a researcher seeking funding, if you want to start working in a biotech DAO or get involved in any way, please visit Molecule's website at molecule.to for more information. Thanks again for tuning in, and see you again soon. <laughs>